Sports. Who doesn't love sports? A pastime as old as throwing rocks at people who look different. Now me personally, I'm getting a little tired of these basic ass vanilla sports. Football, baseball, basketball, psh, too normy for my liking. I need something new, something fun, something unique. I need something that'll make people look at me and go, wow, that guy's into some pretty cool underground stuff. He's so cool and handsome and his mustache fits his face perfectly. He totally doesn't look like Paul Blart on Ozempic. So I went searching far and wide, all across the internet to find the craziest sports that I've never heard of. And I'm willing to bet a crisp $5 bill that you've never heard of them either. And if you have heard of them, then you're weird. You're spending too much time on the internet, man. You should call your mom more often. She misses you. But before we get into it, I want to know, what's the weirdest sport you've ever played? You ever make up something fun with you and your neighborhood friends? I want to know about it. Comment down below. For me personally, me and my cousins used to play this really exotic game called soccer. Have you heard of it? Probably not. It hasn't made it here yet, but when it does, you guys are going to love it. So let's start things off with the slowest sport in the world. And I'm not talking about molasses tap dancing, I'm talking about the legendary sport of snail racing. Snail racing is a common pastime in bars and pubs all across the UK. But some people take it a little bit more serious. Cause as humans, we can't have anything that's just nice and casual, can we? Wait, what'd you say? Wait, you think your snail's faster than mine? I don't think so, buddy. I got turbo over here on the track. You say that sh again, I'll fucking kill you. So back in the 1960s, in a little town called Norfolk, England, Tom Elwes founded the World Championships for Snail Racing. Every year, competitors from all across the globe descend upon the village of Congham to find the best snail of the best snail. Now I gotta be honest with you, I'm having a hard time believing that these are real places. I mean, come on guys, Norfolk, Kongham, England? I don't think so, Palerino. The race typically happens on a circular track, where the snails start in the middle and then race to be the first one to touch the outside perimeter. Owners are not allowed to touch the snails during the race or do anything that could make the snails go faster than they should. Now my question is, what the hell does that mean? That rule implies the existence of performance enhancing snail drugs, like snail Adderall, or as we say on the street, Slime drivers. Good golly, Miss Molly, if this isn't just the most exhilarating sport to watch. <sighs> now this is something that your geriatric family members could get behind. It's nice and slow, easy on the heart, not a lot of excitement, but I need something with a little bit more thrill, more stakes, more produce. That takes us to a little root-based vegetable competition called rutabaga curling. Now rutabaga curling is a lot like real curling, except with rutabagas. You know rutabagas. These things? Yeah, apparently these things are real. I've never seen a goddamn rutabaga in my life, and I'm willing to bet that you haven't either. And if you have, prove it. Comment down below. What do they smell like? Hmm? What do they smell like? The spores started back in December of 1997, when vendors at the Ithaca Farmer's Market in New York got a little bit bored and started rolling their produce down the aisle. And just like true Americans, it quickly became very competitive. Since then, rules have been established by Steve Sarajic, or Saragike, or Saragikikik. I don't know, I can't find how to pronounce his last name on the internet, but don't worry because Steve has another title we can call him. The High Commissioner of the International Rutabaga Curling Championship. What a name, am I right? With a title like that, I bet Steve here gets more straight pussy than an animal shelter. The competition takes place every year at the Ithaca's Farmer's Market on the last day of the market season, which typically falls on the third weekend of December. You know what else falls on the third weekend of December? The elderly. They don't get much traction on the ice. They're just out there slipping and sliding around like some Beyblades. Poor little fuckers. Only rutabagas are allowed to be used at the competition, but an exception to this rule was made in 2005 to allow the use of turnips. This emergency decision was absolutely necessary because the official rutabagas were still frozen and unavailable for use. I'd hate to be the moron that forgot to put the rutabagas out to thaw for the official competition. You'd be the biggest idiot in Ithaca. The sport has a long line of illustrious competitors, including the 2009 first place winner, Lorette Hot and Spicy Dolch, the 2022 second place winner, Melissa Big Mama D, 2015 first place winner, Michael Chewbacca Soybert, and who could possibly forget 2001 second place winner, Random Woman from the West Coast? 
That's her official name. She's up there on the leaderboard. She's up there forever. You can't do anything to take her down. But just like any real sport, it isn't free from a little bit of controversy. Back in 2008, one competitor's rutabaga accidentally collided with a wooden barrier and split right in half. Upon inspection, the rutabaga was found to be rotten in the middle. The crowd voted to allow the contestant to throw one replacement rutabaga, which is typically against the rules. But that replacement rutabaga really came in clutch because that competitor was none other than Tom Manzano. Zell, the man who went on to win first place at the 2008 competition. Saved by the bell, more like saved by the bee, like the vegetable, the one that looks like a rutabaga, they look alike, don't they? Surely they do. Ah, sh not really. Eh, well, you know what? Fuck that joke. Now this competition is pretty cool. It seems like a nice, wholesome tradition that brings people together every year. It's great. It's just, it's a little too white for me. I didn't want to be the one to say it, but come on guys, just look at this. This is just about the whitest thing I've ever seen, and I should know. I'm a professional white. Well, what about a sport for the multitasking man? Well, that's where extreme ironing comes in. The name is pretty self-explanatory, but according to the Extreme Ironing Bureau, which is a real thing, extreme ironing is a danger sport that combines the thrills of an extreme outdoor activity with the satisfaction of a well-pressed shirt. Huh. Who doesn't love a well-pressed shirt? I know I do. It's up there with puppies, kittens, and sneezing. Top five favorite things right there. What's my fifth thing? Cliffhangers. Extreme ironing was invented in 1997 in Leicester, England by Phil Shaw. Mr. Shaw came home one night and he had a very difficult decision to make. He could do his chores like some sort of virgin, or he could go rock climbing like a total chad. After going back and forth for a while, Phil came up with a brilliant idea. He decided he would take his laundry with him and iron his shirts while rock climbing. And thus, the lovable laundry-based extreme sport was born. This really makes me feel like a piece of shit, because I can hardly do laundry by itself, and these people are doing it while conquering nature's most daunting environments. Just look at this. Swimming with sharks? Zip lining? Skydiving? Hell, these guys are doing it while hiding their PTSD. Now, the fun thing about extreme ironing is that no one really takes it seriously. It's a very tongue-in-cheek sport, which is awesome for someone like me, someone who hates the thought of anybody losing. I just want everyone to be happy. I want everyone to win, even you. Yes, you. Unless you're not on steroids right now, are you? You're just looking a little extra juicier than usual. You're sweating a lot. You got some veins popping out of your neck. You, uh, your hairline's receding. You got pimples everywhere. So you're either on steroids or you haven't shit in three days. Either way, I want you to be happy too. Maybe extreme ironing is a little too fun for you, too relaxed, too laid back. You might want something a little bit more competitive. If that's the case, then maybe footnet's more your thing. Oh, you don't know what footnet is? I'm sorry, I forgot that I was speaking to uncultured swine. You are, aren't you? You're a little uncultured piggy, huh? I want you oink down there. Why don't you oink in the comment section? Oink if you're a piggy. Oink if you're a piggy. See, for the uninitiated, footnet is a combination of soccer and tennis. And I know that it's called footnet because it's a combination of the words football and net, but I refuse to call soccer football, all right? Sorry, not gonna happen. This is not a football player. This is a football player. I mean, just look at that forehead. You could feed a family of five off that goddamn thing. The sport dates back to 1922 when members of the football club Slavia Prague started playing a game that they like to call football over the rope. Well, that name isn't on the nose at all. Not too obvious. Why not just call it kick the ball over the rope into your opponent's area more times than they kick the ball into your area so that you can win the game? The game. The first footnet cup was played in 1940. And between 1953 and 1961, the first league was played called Tromska Liga. Man, as someone who struggles with basic English, some of these languages, good God, you guys must have six packs on your tongues. Now this is absolutely a sport that I could see myself getting into as a fan. I mean, just look how cool this is. Why isn't this a bigger spectacle? I mean, look at all those empty seats, man. I've seen more people gather to watch two street cats fight over a can of tuna. Now how about if you're looking for a sport that's actually bettering the world, cleaning up the mess that the human race has been making for thousands of years? Well, if that's the case, then you're looking for a sport by the name of Spogomi. And no, that's not a type of deli meat that you order for your sandwich, dad. Spogomi is a sport invented in Japan in 2008, where teams compete against each other to see who can pick up the most garbage. The first Spogomi World Cup was held in Japan in November of 2023, and it was won by Great Britain. As if those bastards needed another reason to be cool. 
You guys had Black Sabbath, Monty Python, David Attenborough. Now you want to be the best trash collectors too over my dead body. The sport involves teams of three players collecting trash within a designated area. Each team has one hour to pick up as much trash as possible. Points are rewarded for not only the amount of trash that's collected, but also the type of trash that's collected. For example, cigarette butts are the highest scoring item, because if you get enough of them, then you can empty them into a pipe and smoke them. We've all been there, haven't we guys? Probably not. Kids aren't really into smoking cigarettes anymore, are they? They're more into vapes. Well, what do you do then when you run out of vape? Do you like scrape the resin out of your puff bar and put it in a gravity bong and... God, I hope not. The youth of today would have the same kind of brain damage that Mike Tyson has by the time they turn 18. Well, what about a sport for all my fellow foot enthusiasts? If that's what you're looking for, then let me introduce you to toe wrestling. That's right. Toe wrestling. The most sickening thing I've seen since the day the Challenger exploded. A sickening day and a sad day. This sport was invented back in 1976 in Staffordshire, England because of course this can only come from the land of Brits. The World Toe Wrestling Championship has been held every year since 1994 in Derbyshire, England. The most prolific competitor of all time is none other than Alan Nasty Nash, a multi-time world champion. And yep, I can say confidently that that looks like someone who would be into competitive toe wrestling. All right, maybe you're not into a sport that completely takes your appetite away. That's fine. So what about a sport based around something that every female receptionist with fingernails like an eagle does on a daily basis? Yep, that's right. We're talking about professional typing. The Ultimate Typing Championship is a sport designed to find the fastest fingers in the United States. Well, second fastest fingers behind yours truly. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm a... <laughs> Uh, ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> and let me just say that my fingertips are pruned 24-7. If you get my drift, it's like I let them soak in a glass of salt water. Because <laughs> I, I finger so many women. In this sport, players compete against each other in real-time online typing races. The best of the best will then compete in person at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, the epicenter of knowledge. And the winner will be crowned the ultimate typing champion. The inaugural Ultimate Typing Championship was held on March 14th, 2010. The finals were decided in a best of three, pitting the two best typers in the world, Sean Rona and Nate Bowen. I'm sorry, I didn't know his name off the top of my head. I had to look at my notes. Keep it in. We're keeping it in. Fuck you. During the first round, Rona defeated Bowen 163 to 110 words per minute, setting an unofficial world record. Rona then went on to win the second round, 124 to 79 words per minute, becoming the ultimate typing champion and winning $2,000. Since then, the finals have garnered 17 million views on YouTube. Holy shit, that's a lot of people watching a couple of dudes type. I want you to think about this. 160 63 words per minute. That's about two words per second. That's insane. Imagine how fast you could text your girlfriend and gaslight her into believing that her teeth are too small for her mouth. That's a superpower. A superpower not many would want, but a superpower nonetheless. Well, if professional typing is a little too nerdy for you, then what about professional snowball fighting? Or as the Japanese call it, yukigasen which totally sounds like something you'd see on bootleg Yu-Gi-Oh! merch from Mexico. yuki Gassen is a very popular professional sport that is played all over the world, but specifically in Japan, Finland, Norway, Russia, and Canada. Did I match up on the... Pr probably not. Who gives a shit? The game is played between two teams of seven players each. Each team has a flag, and if you capture the opposing team's flag or eliminate every player, then you win. The name Yuki Gassen is a compound of the Japanese words Yuki, meaning snow, and Gassen, meaning battle. Man, Japanese is such a cool language. I'd love to learn it, but I don't want to be that 20-something-year-old white guy who randomly starts learning Japanese. That's a weird look in my opinion. Sorry, you little anime nerds ruin that for us normal people. <laughs> now you may not know this about your old Uncle Johnny, but back in my day, they called me the Midwestern Powder Slinger. And it's not just because of my alleged drug distribution crimes, it's because I had the strongest arm in the neighborhood. I could have thrown a snowball through a stop sign back in my day. You don't want to see me on the Yuki Gassen court. I'd wipe out a whole team, three balls, flat. But maybe the cold weather isn't for you. If that's the case, then what about some cycling-based sports? And I'm not talking about that pussy-ass Lance Armstrong bullshit with the tight spandex. No, I'm talking about a real sport. Cycle ball. Never heard of it? Well, 
you're missing out. Cycle ball is a sport similar to soccer, but it's played on bicycles. Two people on each team ride a fixed gear bicycle with no brakes, and they're only allowed to touch the ball with the wheel or their head. This head, not penis. The sport was founded all the way back in 1883 by American cyclist Nicholas Edward Kaufman. The first match was played on September 14th of the same year between Kaufman and another cyclist named John Featherly. The first world championships were held in 1929 and it quickly spread to Germany, which is the modern day home of the sport. The most successful players of all time were the Pospisil brothers of Czechoslovakia, who were world champions 20 times between 1965 and 1988. God, I wish I had a more positive relationship with my brother. We could be world champions in a super niche sport, but instead, we have a rocky relationship and only talk twice a year when mom forces us to. Now this is unironically a super hype sport. Watching these dudes flick the ball into the goal just with their front wheel is cool as f this is another sport that could absolutely dominate the mainstream. It just needs more of an audience. What it really needs is its first superstar. It's LeBron James. It's Tom Brady. It's Alan Nasty Nash. Someone please come take this sport to the mainstream. But what if two wheels are too much for you? That's where unicycle basketball comes in, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's basketball played on unicycles. Get with the program. And it looks pretty stupid, to be honest, but if you play some silly cartoon music over it, I could get behind this. So what about a sport for the common man? Enough of these rich men activities. I can't even afford a unicycle. Well, that's where the greatest sport of all time comes in. And I'm not even joking. I'm serious. The best sport that you've never heard of. Worm charming. The sport of worm charming is very simple. Each competitor gets a patch of ground and a designated amount of time to get as many worms to the surface as possible. These certified athletes can use just about any method that they wish, except for one. Dishwashing detergent. That's right, the use of dishwashing detergent has been banned, and it's the only thing that's been banned, which feels like a weird thing to ban. Dish soap? You're not gonna ban magnets? Or dynamite? Or semen? What about semen? Am I allowed to go out there and make some mud? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, mama. The annual World Worm Charming Championships are held every year in Cheshire, England. Because, of course, a sport about hunting worms takes place in some sort of Harry Potter-ass country. You know what? I've been really hard on British people in this video, and I'm sorry. You guys don't deserve that. I'm just taking out my frustrations on not being very funny on you, and it's not fair. So I apologize. And if you're a British viewer and you've stuck around this long and you're still watching the video, Leave, get out of here. Now this is a sport that I can get behind and I honestly feel like I might be able to be the best in the world at it. Seriously, I've been digging around for worms since you were doing laps in your daddy's nutsack. Give me 15 minutes and I'll give you an entire extended family of worms. Sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, the weird uncle that no one really invites, but you know, he still shows up for some reason. He still finds out that we're having a family get together. We told you, don't invite Randy. Why do you keep inviting Randy? So that's it. That's all the craziest sports that I could find around the internet. Or at least as many as I could fit into a 20 minute video. Is it 20 minutes? That's what I was shooting for. If it's more than 20 minutes, fucking high five, dude. Comment down below and tell me which one was your favorite. Personally, I might be the newest fan of Worm Charming. I'll definitely be flying out to Cheshire for the next World Championships and I'm gonna show those silly little Brits how a real American digs for worms. There's one big secret. Fentanyl. But going through these classic pastimes has reminded me what's so great about the whole concept of sports. It's not really about the game, the points, the athletes, the records. It's about the camaraderie that is made between the fans. It's about seeing someone who roots for the same team as you do and going, hey, right on, dude, right on. <laughs> That dude's a fucking bitch. Take the Rutabaga Curling Championships, for example. Once a year, people all over the world gather to this farmer's market to roll vegetables into a wall. And let me tell you a secret. It's not really about rolling the Rutabaga. It's about the adventure. It's about the friends you make along the way. I know that sounds cheesy, but it's true. Hell, you might even find your true love at that farmer's market. Hopefully not at Ithaca, because she'd probably be a stuck-up bitch, but hey, beggars can't be choosers, and Lord knows that I'm begging right now. I'm begging for a microcosm of pussy, fellas. 
Man, I wish I was more into sports. I was a band kid in high school, if you couldn't tell, if it wasn't obvious, so I don't really know anything about football, but God, I could name every single scale under the sun. I only ever really played one sport. As a kid, me and my friends would go down to the local VA and we'd hurl rocks at the patients sitting outside in their wheelchairs, and by golly, they'd get so mad, but they'd never be able to catch us, because we had feet and they had wheels. 